Thank you very much. Esther, thank you for the words. Good thing I treated you nicely when you were working for me. <laughs> it's great to see all of you here. To Mickey Ibarra and the Latino Leaders Network, congratulations on the success of an idea that has now become something that we all benefit from when we eat the fruit of these great luncheons. To all the sponsors who make it possible, especially our two main sponsors, Coca-Cola and Verizon. To Peter, thank you. To Rudy, thank you. You know, this is the kind of party Rudy's accustomed to throwing. The only difference is that people showed up to this one. <laughs> Only a Becerra can say that to another Becerra, huh? Okay, don't, don't you try that. I've been told that we may have votes soon, so I probably will keep my remarks a little briefer than I expected. But I've also, for those Tejanos who are in the room, I've learned very well from, from a Tejano who once said to me, remember, your speech is no different from that long horde steer that we're accustomed, the horns on that long horn steer that we're accustomed to seeing in Texas. A point here, a point there, and a lot of bull in between. So uh, remember what you say. I know that Congressman Mike Honda was here, I believe had to leave, and Congressman Filner, I believe, also came by. I want to thank them for having come and recognize the importance of this luncheon. To Ambassadors Sarukan, and Descayar, uh, I want to say thank you for being here as well. To all of you leaders in your own right, thank you for being leaders and recognizing the, need, the, the importance of coming together to network and learn from each other. I think we're all very blessed. I know for a fact I am very blessed. It's really interesting. You're always told once you start to have an opportunity to do things, don't forget from where you came. Don't forget. And for many of us, I know for me, those origins were very, very humble. My father got to about the sixth grade. My mother came from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, and she married my father at the age of 18. And while they never had a lot to give, they always gave back to this country. But what I have learned is that too often we're so busy trying to remember from where we came that we forget to live, leave a little bit of worm, a room to work towards where we have to go. Sometimes we're a little too humble. Sometimes we're a little too appreciative of what we've accomplished. Sometimes we forget that a lot of it was as a result of our own effort. People help, but recognize when the force of your own will and the sheer effort behind your tenacity has given you a chance to be where you are. Not long ago, my daughter who plays softball, she's in the fourth grade, was at bat and a good friend of ours, a neighbor friend of ours, he's always trying to cheer on the team. And he would always yell to all the kids and when Natalia, my daughter, got up to bat, he said it the same thing. And it struck me when he said it, when I started thinking about some words I was gonna give at a future speech, He'd always get up there and buy the uh, diamond and say to the kids, be a hitter, be a hitter. Because, you know, most of the time these kids, when they pitch, they don't throw anything but balls. And so <laughs> all the kids just watch and they get on base free because there's so many balls that are thrown, they don't have to worry about strikes. So he's always telling them, be a hitter, be a hitter. Be a hitter. I want to be a hitter. I want to remember my humble origins. I want to thank those who made it possible for me to rise. I want to help those who didn't get help. But I want to be a hitter. Because if I just spend my time thanking people and remembering from where I came, I won't have time to hit that ball out of the park. And I got to hit it out of the park because there are too many people who will never get to go to that plate to take the bat, to take one swing at the ball. And so I better be a hitter. And so, Vicki. So, Mickey, I say to you, thank you for being a hitter and knowing the importance of bringing all of us together so we can all have our, our turn at the plate. 
Now, I've witnessed and experienced a lot in my 16 plus years in the Congress. I've halted legislative activity on the floor of the House to defend legal immigrant seniors, elderly who were being told they would have to lose their supplemental security income so we could play for the unemployment benefits of people back in 1993 when we were suffering through another recession. I captained the defeat in 1994 of a proposal on the floor of the House to bar children from attending school simply because they happen to be the children of immigrants, whether legally here or not. I stood up against the impeachment of a president of the United States. I experienced the shock and eerie silence of an abandoned Capitol grounds on September 11, 2001. I challenged a president's rush to war in Iraq in 2002 as one of only 128 to vote against a resolution to authorize war in Iraq in, out of 435. I stood up early to help elect the first president of the United States of color. I helped pass, I authored and helped pass the legislation you've been told about that establishes a commission that I hope in the near future gives us a chance to break ground on what will be the Museum of the American Latino here in Washington, D.C. I was offered a post on the president's cabinet. I'm still here. <laughs> and along the way, I had a chance with my beautiful wife to have three children. But there's something that I remember that I was told the first year I got to Congress in 1993 that I, re that I remember so very well. It was told to me by Congressman Esteban Torres. One day, as we were in the rush of activity in committee and a vote was called, we were hurrying to get to the vote on the floor of the House before they closed the, the rolls. And as we were rushing up the steps of the East Capitol steps, I, said to, I turned to Esteban and I said, you know, Esteban, sometimes I forget where I'm about to go. And he stopped me right there and he grabbed my shoulder and he said, Javier, never forget where you're about to go because very few people in the history of this country have had a chance to walk these steps and enter through those doors where you're about to go. And that has stayed with me for so long because Esteban wanted me to be a hitter. And I think about that more and more and I wish to myself, Esteban, why didn't you tell me that 30 years before, not in 1993, but in 1963, when as a five-year-old, I, I saw my mom crying in front, front of the television set, not understanding why a television set, television set would make my mother cry. And then learning a little bit later why she was crying, but still not quite understanding. Why would a woman who was born and raised in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, only nine plus years in this country, cry for a president she never met who had been assassinated? Esteban, if you'd been around a couple of years later, a few years later when I started school, and all of a sudden, I went from being Javier for all of my life up to the age of five, and all of a sudden, I got a new name, Xavier. <laughs> Esteban, had you been there, you would have helped me understand what was going on. Esteban, had you been there, you would have helped me understand as I was growing up, and when people would ask, so what does your dad do, what, do you, what does your mom do? And I would have to tell them, well, my dad's a worker in construction, and every day he gets up with the sun and doesn't come home till the sun's down. And every day when he comes home, he doesn't come dressed like me. He comes home very dirty. And Stephen, you could have helped me understand that I should not have been embarrassed to explain to people what my father did, even though people would say, now, Johnny, don't you grow up to be like that guy on the side of the road there digging those ditches, because that was my dad digging those ditches. Stephen, I could have used you the day I got to Stanford University, living two hours from there, being raised in Sacramento, California, but never having been there before until the day I actually was set to enroll, and understood that I hadn't grown up middle class the way I had thought. When I drove through Palo Alto, right around Stanford University, I realized, wow, this, this is middle class, huh? This isn't bad, I'm glad I'm going to college. I could have used Esteban Torres' words a little earlier. 
I suspect a lot of us could have used the words of someone like Esteban Torres a little earlier to tell us, be proud of who you are. Know who got you here. Don't ever forget from where you came. But someone has to stop us in that moment when we're thinking that we're on top of the world and say, stop. Know where you're about to go. You know, it's that Star Trek moment. Go where no man has ever gone before. <laughs> and so I, I remember what Esteban said. I remember him fondly for having told me that. And today, I can tell you a few stories of what it means to now know what it means to go forward. Today, when someone asks me, well, so what did your father do? I say, he built America. He built America because he really did. I don't know about some other folks, but I know my dad put shovel in the ground, put pick on the hard dirt, and every day he built America. And one day, <laughs> one day my father was working in a crew, and I had a chance to be in that crew because I had to help pay for my education in college. And I had the great privilege of being able to pull the jackhammer away from my father's hands. And that's one of the most proud, uh, proud moments I, I can think of because that was the day that it really hit me how proud I was of what my father did, that I could help do what he was doing, but yet I know he was helping me do what I would get to do. And so, Esteban, I wish you had explained to me earlier in life why I should say to, about my father, not when I was in my 20s, but it, when I was in my teens, how proud I was of what my father did with a sixth grade education. I can tell you today that that day in 1994, when I decided to captain the opposition to an amendment on the floor of the house to deny kids access to our schools unless they could prove that their parents were here legally, that the day before I had sat with a friend who no longer is with us, may she rest in peace. Her name was Patsy Mink, Congresswoman Patsy Mink from Hawaii. She was a fighter all her life. I had gone to Patsy. We were on the same committee, Education and Labor, and I said to her, Patsy, I've been told that we're going to have an amendment on the floor that's going to restrict in this education bill, it's going to restrict kids from going to school unless their parents can come in to the school and document that they're here legally. And I've been told that we don't want to have this amendment come up because we're afraid it's going to pass. And I've been given an alternative that would soften it a little bit, not make it as bad an amendment. And Patsy Mink, she was about four foot nine, power, which is a power plug all the way through. And she said to me, Javier, did, you just got here, right? Did, did you come here to compromise your values so soon? <laughs> and... You know, I'm looking down at her, and I'm thinking, well, my God. this little lady's telling me uh, what to do. And so the next day, when I was asked by some of the members in the then the Democratic leadership, well, you ready to do this alternative amendment? I, I said, no, we're, let's go forward, and let's see what happens. And that debate started with very few of us on the floor because no one wanted to debate immigration in 1994. And a few of us were there, and we stood there, and we said our piece why we should oppose this amendment. And then something very wonderful happened. Before you know it, I started to see a few other people tr trickle in. The one I remember most was a gentleman by the name of Kwesi Mfume, who at the time was the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, who came in, who was always an impassioned speaker, and came in and said, this isn't about immigrant kids. This is not about Latino kids. This is about our kids. And he said, and... A fight to keep a kid in school is not just your fight. A fight to keep a kid in school is my fight. And before you know it, we started to have more members coming into the chamber to argue. And then before you know it, the op those who were for the amendment had come to us and said, are you willing to compromise and cut off debate trip pretty soon and let's take a vote on it? I said, no, 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 let's let this amendment go its course. In 1994, when in, in California we passed Proposition 187, on the floor of the House of Representatives, we defeated this amendment to keep kids from going to school. I'm very proud of that. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
you learn a lot, but you don't realize it till a lot later, until someone like a Congressman Torres stops you, stops you and tells you and wakes you up. I remember in 1990, I had gotten elected to the state legislature. And shortly after taking office, I started going around the district and I had a chance to go to a Chamber of Commerce luncheon to meet many of the people in the, the city of Alhambra, which I represented at the time in California. And I was having a good time meeting some folks in, in a small crowd. I had one woman say to me, oh, you know, we, we really like you as our congressman. You blend so well. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time, compliment? Insult. Huh? I take it as a compliment. And I take it as that because I don't have time to dwell on the past. I have to recognize where I'm going. And fortunately for me, I was good enough that she thought I blended well and that I could keep moving forward. Now, in 1994, as a Democrat, we suffered a major defeat when we lost the House of Representatives. Interestingly enough, I had a lot of my colleagues, white colleagues, come to me and this being in the minority is a bear, and I said, get used to it. Uh, so. <laughs> it one of, that was one of the times when it put things in context that life is not so bad. I have gone through things that some are barely getting to experience. They're babes in the woods when it comes to some of this politics. We've had to go through this for so long in our life. When I turned 18 and went to Stanford University, I regained my name. I became Javier Becerra again. Why? Because I realized I'm Javier. I'm not Xavier. So today, to this day, I can still tell you who my friends are and when I met them by when they come to, hey, Xavier, I know it was a high school friend. Eh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I... Um, I suffered some real humiliation when I was in the fourth grade when being in the band and having performed for the, all the parents on that school night, we had finished our song. And you know, in those days when you're in fourth grade, you could play a, maybe a range of five notes. And so it's basics, I want to hold your hand. And um, we had finished. We were all leaving the, uh, the stage from the sides. My parents, who rarely had a chance to come to anything I did in school, were there in the audience. As we're walking down the, the sides of the auditorium, filing out, I see my mother get up in the crowd. All the crowd's clapping. I see my mother get up. And then I see her start walking through the people that are sitting there towards where I'm heading. And it's one of those things where it's like a guided missile kind of thing where it's heading <laughs> same direction. And I said, oh, my mom, oh, my God, mom, sit down, sit down, sit down. Mom, mom, sit down, sit down. And before you know it, she caught me. She's, all those who are for Star Wars should know my mom because they, you'd know how to really make that Star Wars process work. Uh, uh, she caught me. She gave me this big bear hug and this great kiss. And dijo, estamos tan orgulloso de ti. Oh, I said, oh, mom, why did you do this? This is the most embarrassing thing that could happen. Afterwards, we're all celebrating having the little uh, lemonade and, and Kool-Aid and cookies. And, and I say, Mom, you, you, God, why did you do that? Mom, now I can't go talk to my friends. And I was so embarrassed. He said, mijo, ¿qué querías que haga? Sentíamos algo tan, tan, she couldn't say it. She couldn't, tan orgullosos. Nunca habíamos, nunca te habíamos visto Tocar. We had never seen you perform before. I said, oh, you know, when you're in fourth grade, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, my. <laughs> like that jackhammer incident, I now realize why my mother was so determined to make it through that line of parents and get to her son. Because I think she saw many things that could come for that child. She started with so little. They came from Mexico when my father married her with nothing. And so to build up was for them a major achievement. And so when I was graduating from Stanford University, 
actually, I deserve to get a hugging because I wasn't sure what I was going to get out. But uh, <laughs> uh, I fully expected my mother to do another beeline at the graduation ceremonies. She was, she was very good. She didn't. She, <laughs> she spared me. But I would have I been okay with it by then because I had learned to understand and appreciate that hug. But the reason I mention that story about fourth grade is because today I have a fourth grader, my daughter Natalia, who's a softball player. And I, I want to mention this story to you as I come close to concluding my remarks. We recently told our three daughters, my wife and I, that we're going to move the family back to Washington, D.C. because it's just too much of a bear to go back and forth every week, every week, and try to really spend enough time with family and still do work in the district at the same time. And while we actually lived here as a family in the late 90s as well, in fact, my fourth grader was born in Washington, D.C. before we moved her back at a very young age, now they're teenagers almost all of them. The 11-year-old is the only one that's not a teenager, and it's a little tougher. They've got their own life. And it wasn't something they wanted to accept readily. And as much as we expected our oldest, this, this now 16-year-old, or about to turn 16, to give us the most difficulty, breaking her up from her friends, those relationships, she's becoming very independent, it was our 11-year-old who was insistent, you're not going you're just, no, we're not going to do this. We're going we're to stay. This is where we are. This is where we live. We're going to stay. We're going to stay. And over the course of several weeks, kept talking about it, kept talking about it. The older ones started getting better. Okay, well, we're, we're going to get our own room. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> but the little one, I don't know why you guys keep talking like that. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> we're not going. One day, I came back from D.C. and I told Carolina, my wife, and the girls, I went and saw some homes. There's some pretty nice ones out there. And the girls, the older ones said, well, let us see the, the photos of the homes. And we showed them. And the little one didn't want to see them, didn't care to see them. We're not going. I don't know why you guys are looking at that stuff. <laughs> and finally I said, Mija, we, we're going to go. I would lo really love it if you would take a look at these photographs. Give me a sense of what you like and what you don't like. She left. My wife and I are looking at each other. What do we do? You know, just give her time. We just, you know, just gonna go with the flow. And so later that evening, at night, um, it was Sunday night, so I was getting ready to take the red eye back to D.C. I was working on the computer upstairs in the office, and Natalia comes up to the room. And she, I'm working. I turn around. I see her. She comes up to me. She doesn't say a word. She has a little tiny piece of paper, and she hands it to me. And then she walks away. I said, what the heck is going on? I open up the little piece of paper, and there written on there is one word with an exclamation point. Congratulations. I had just gotten elected to be vice chair of the Democratic Caucus, and that solidified our decision to make the move to Washington, D.C. And uh, I still have that little piece of paper where she said congratulations because she still doesn't want to move, but uh, <laughs> I think... My daughters, I hope my wife and I are working as a family to know what's coming next. That as much as we want to remember our humble origins, as much as my daughter doesn't want to leave what is secure, as much as we sometimes don't want to deal with the unexpected, feel like we're going to lose that amendment, as much as sometimes it's more comfortable to remember and only remember from where we came. Natalia, Maria Teresa Becerra, my mother, Manuel Becerra, my father, and I hope Javier Becerra have learned what Esteban Torres tried to tell me that day in 1993. Don't you ever forget where you're about to go. And so as we move forward, it's not to talk about what we've accomplished or what I've experienced is to talk about what's coming next. Those kids who in 1996 as immigrant children were denied access to health care simply because they were immigrant kids, this year with a new president are now back receiving health care under the S-CHIP program with the signature of President Barack Obama. <laughs> the 
This year, if Harry and Louise, if we hit them out of the park, we might have health care reform the way we really deserve it. This year, if we're smart and recognize that our time is running out, we may actually start to deal with energy the way we should and understand it's not free. This year, and by God, this is where all of us have to go to the plate and be hitters. And this year, with the help of a president who understands this, but more importantly, with a network of Latino leaders, as we have here, we can hit it out of the park and give dignity back to all our, our immigrants who are in this country and say we will reform our immigration laws to give them what they deserve. And so I want to thank you for letting me come and chat with you about my experiences, but more importantly, I just wanted to let you know Esteban Torres is still in my mind. His words are still with me. I'm going to be a hitter, and I'm going to remember where I got to go. I hope you'll join me because there is much to do for many people, like my parents, who never got to go there but made it possible for all of us to enjoy this lunch today. Thank you very much.